All right, so next up we have um, Steve Sapir who's going to provide an overview of the oil spill um, outreach communication effort, the regional effort that's happening in the Gulf of Mexico, and he will be followed by some oil spill science updates presented by our oil spill outreach coordinators in person. So for this next segment, I'm going to ask um, everyone to hold questions until the end, just jot them down. We'll have, hopefully have a, a little bit of time at the end for some Q&A and some discussion after everybody is finished. So Steve is helping me out by queuing his slides. Thank you. Sorry about that. All right, well, thank you all again for the impetus behind developing this entire regional meeting was to share the oil spill science. And as you know, we've built quite a bit around that, hopefully uh, to respond to the things that y'all also were interested in, in addition to oil spill science. So um, what we're going to be talking about today is we're sharing quite a bit of science with you. But before that, the planning committee asked uh, our team to share some of the opportunities, challenges, strategies we've used to implement a regional activity. The first thing we would really value from you in the middle of your tables are these forms that are blue colored, and there's just two questions on it. While you're seeing this presentation over the next hour or so, if you think of oil spill science questions that you think would help you do your job better, answers to those questions, please fill that out. And you can also help us by answering question number two, as we're working on a proposal for continued work uh, that will help us. So we'll collect that during the break. We appreciate any feedback y'all provide us um, because we will use that time for, for our, the rest of the team to share some of the science that they think may resonate with y'all. There's things on coastal resilience that you'll hear about today, things on community development, work for it, well, some maybe working waterfront work, other things. But I'm going to introduce Monica Wilson, who's Florida Sea Grant, a physical oceanographer, and so she's going to share some of the work that she's done, and not that she's done, she's sharing some of the work that the government scientists and others have done uh, related to the water Good morning. Um, Steve said, I'm Monica Wilson, I'm a forestry grant, and I'm going to be sharing some science on um, coastal transport, a little background on disperses, and some about oil on our beaches. Um, so as much as we know, the Deepwater Horizon oil spill occurred on April 20th in 2010. Um, the, oil, um, the explosion of the rig killed 11 people and oil flowed out of the well for approximately 87 days. Um, sorry. Better? Better. Got it. Thank you. Um, I lost my <laughs> <laughs> um, So, this was the largest accidental spill in U.S. history and the first time that dispersants were actually used um, below the water surface. Um, so, well, I don't know if you can see that very well. Um, so this is a map that was developed using uh, NOAA's environmental um, research management, management application. And so this is just a map showing the overall extension of the oil spill. It's not a cumulative map, it just shows which areas were oiled for a length of time. Uh, the yellow is the location of where the well was or is, and um, as you can see, the gray, the darker grays are near the well because that was, that was the area that was below for the longest period of time. Um, and the next slide is similar to what you just saw. However, these little orange spaghetti lines show where dispersants were sprayed using airplanes. So on the surface, airplanes and boats were used um, to apply dispersants, um, and then they also used dispersants at the wellhead, which I'll get into in just a minute. So this is just an overall graphic of what was happening during the time. It's not exactly, um, it's not to scale. However, we just wanted to come up with a graphic that shows everything that was going on during the um, response. And so as you can see at the surface, they, like I said before, they, uh, they applied dispersants by plane and boat. And then under the water, near the well, they would just uh, apply dispersants using ROVs. Uh, and about a month later, after the spill actually started, they realized that there was plumes at those, um, I forgot about that. On the surface, they, they uh, using satellite imagery, they came up with a number that approximately 29,000 square miles of surface water was oiled. Um, and they used 1.8 million gallons of dispersants at the surface. 
within the water column, as I said, they found that there was plumes of those specific, specific depths that you see up there, and they again used dispersants within the water column to try to limit the amount of oil that was rising to the surface. Um, so this large scale application of dispersants um, raised many questions and highlighted the importance of studying this and figuring out what were the environmental impacts. So I'll, just a quick background on dispersants. Um, so these um, contain molecules that have an end that is attracted to oil and an end that is attracted to water. And so these molecules attach to oil, they form droplets that allow the oil to mix within the water column and make it more readily available to naturally break down whether it's either um, uh, bacteria or other organisms in the water column. So now I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some of the studies that have been going on. Um, so DOS is a chemical that's found in forex and scientists can actually measure concentrations of DOS to see where it is persisting in the environment. Um, so one study, uh, scientists used this DOS measurement and they went out four years after the spill um, and went to these specific locations that you see on this map and these areas were heavily oiled. And so they went out and um, sampled uh, tar balls and sand patties and tested them for DOS and they found that it was the levels and concentrations were catching and consistent, and this is mainly due because these tar balls are coming off from tar mats that are offshore that nobody really sees until the tar balls, that, or nobody really knows about until these tar balls come up to the surface. Um, but the main thing was that they still found this DOS even four years after the oil spill occurred. Another study, um, so a community in Orange Beach, Alabama, took it upon themselves to take water samples in their near shore environment and in their area um, to see if DOS were, uh, was present in their waters because they were afraid that this, all this spraying of dispersants was ending up near their, their waters and they were a little concerned. So they took upon themselves and made, um, made a test of the waters and they did find DOS. However, um, the scientists that went back and looked at their data saw that the concentrations of DOS were much higher than what would be expected. It was, if it was from the actual DOS that was used during the, the oil spill. So Orange Beach, Alabama is located fairly far away from the wellhead. So the amount of concentrations that they've been finding closer to the shore were not nearly as high as the, they were finding in their, in their water samples. The reason for this is um, DOS is also the, uh, found in detergents. It can be found in cosmetics and laxatives. So the scientists um, came up with saying that this was more likely due to um, non-point sources, such as storm water runoff from these everyday products that these, these communities are using. So it's not always related to the but it was the main point. So what happened, now I'm going to talk to you about what happened with most of the oil. So this pie graph just shows, um, it's from the oil budget calculator, and it basically says what happened to most of the oil. Uh, we can see approximately 70% was recovered from the actual wellhead. There's still about anywhere between 11 and 30 percent that's unaccounted for. Um, about 20 to 25 percent was evaporated and uh, dissolved, and then 13 percent naturally dispersed. The rest was either chemically dispersed, burned, or skipped. Um, what, what has happened now, scientists have been doing more studies about this unaccounted for oil, and they have found that approximately 3 to 5 percent of this unaccounted oil is on the sea floor. Um, approximately 1,200 miles, uh, square miles is contaminated with different concentrations of um, and the problem is that since it's colder temperatures, lack of sunlight, and less oxygen, this oil can actually remain in the system a little longer. It doesn't get broken down as, as easily. Um, so how does this oil get on the, on the sea floor? So here are some potential pathways. Um, oils can mix with particles, either burning snow or even, um, let's say, sediment coming off from river plume. Once oil mixes with some of those um, particles, it just sinks and goes to the sea floor. Um, there's also fecal pellets from zooplankton that have ingested anything that contains oil and they excrete it. That ends up on the sea floor as well. Um, there's also, uh, when emergency responders actually used burning to get rid of some of the oil, the byproducts from that can also sink into the water column and on the sea floor. Um, and then they know that compounds from that plume that I showed you in the earlier graph um, eventually sink out and make their way to the sea floor as well. So I'm going to move over um, and talk about a little bit more about oil transport and show some of the science that's going on with that. So one of the Goldman Consortium cards, um, they deployed over 300 drifters in the northern Gulf of Mexico near the, or near the wellhead and near the coast of Louisiana. 
And um, these drifters bring back data approximately uh, every five minutes. So they have gathered over six million data points. And so a lot of government scientists use numerical models to actually look and see how the oil is dispersed and how pollutants are transported within these surface currents. So this, So this is um, the drifters as they're going, and a bonus to this study was that Hurricane Isaac came right through in the middle of this project. So the scientists not only got a little bit more information on the surface currents for the Gulf of Mexico, but they also saw the effects of the hurricane on the surface currents for the Gulf of Mexico. So with all this data, these scientists take it back, use this input, uh, use it as input for these models to make them more accurate for future spills, um, so they have a better understanding of how these currents are working. Another study um, for the near shore environment, um, CARP also uh, put in uh, some more drifters um, near, in the near shore, and they used also dyes and drones to try to get a better understanding of what the currents are doing um, in the near shore. So they put dye in the water, and another cool thing that happened is that they caught a rip current. As you can see by the dye, um, they found that the rip current actually makes its way back towards the shore, which was not known before. So this was kind of another cool study that they were able to do. Um, so now about oil on our beaches, and I'm gonna speed up a little bit. Um, so despite the use of dispersant oil still made our beaches, this map is just a, a quick map that shows uh, where oil was found. Blue lines mean no oil was observed, red lines are where uh, beaches were heavily uh, oiled. So. And so approximately 1,700 kilometers of our shorelines were oiled across the Gulf. And this is just a quick partition of what kind of um, shorelines were oiled. So 51% was beaches, 45% was coastal wetlands. So that was a total of 96% on just beaches and wetlands, and 4% of some other type of um, shoreline. And then here's a pie chart that shows you oiling by state. So as you can see, um, Um, so, Louisiana, um, 61% was on Louisiana's coast, so Louisiana took the front of it, um, and the other states did see oiling um, in, in different areas. So now a little bit about oil on our beaches. So, how does oil get on our beaches? Well, if, when waters come up and there's oil in the water, and then the water is beside, the oil just happens to um, get um, on the shore, and eventually when a sand washes over, it gets buried, and um, you can get sand underneath the actual, or excuse me, oil in tar gulf underneath the sand. Uh, another way is that when these waters come in, uh, you can get sinking oil again because it's been uh, tracked or combined with sand and it sinks out in, into the surf zone, and then you get these buried tar mats. Again, sand eventually gets pushed over it and so they get hidden. Well, when storms come and larger waves and wind energy comes, these tar mats that you see underneath these that are buried get tumbled around and they break up and form into these surface residual walls or tar walls, and most of them have probably heard them being called, and they come up on beaches. So one study um, from, again, in Alabama, uh, went and took, uh, tried to look at surface residual walls after extreme events, and those events are listed up here. And so what they found is that after these extreme events, once the winds and waves relaxed, they were seeing more of these tar balls wash on shore. Uh, so they found that uh, certain wind conditions can, can cause these tar mats to break up, and as the winds and sort of relax, they, they, just, they just get moved offshore from water movement. Um, however, once they reach a critical size, they get harder and harder to find. So once these tar balls start moving in the, in the, in the environment and start getting smaller, they, they, they get much harder to find in your actual um, shores and beaches. And then um, there's also another study. So scientists are also using models to see how these tar balls can move and become trapped, and uh, have learned that they can become trapped in inlets and with, with just normal tidal flow because they're floating around the area. But this study also wanted to see the size of the tar balls and, and figure out how they move in the system and what causes them to move in the system. Higher winds, larger waves, less wind, less, less water movement. Um, so they came up and made artificial tar balls. And what they found was that bigger tar balls, which were approximately 10 centimeters in diameter, sunk and got buried by sand. Um, tar balls within the five centimeter range were actually mobile in the surf and moved around. And then anything less than about one centimeter, it was extremely hard to recover and find 
um, in the peaches. So um, that's just a quick <laughs> overview of a lot of science. Uh, but if you have any questions, just keep them in mind, and I'm sure we'll get them at the end. So now, um, Emily, my Louisiana senior counterpart, is going to continue to talk about um, Coca oil water. Good morning. So I'm Emily Wong Douglas with Louisiana Sea Grant, and I'm going to continue the conversation about. I like to move around. It makes me less nervous. Can you all hear me? It's on. It's a green light. Can you hear me now? Um, so, good morning again. My name is Emily Mom Douglas, and I'm with Louisiana Sea Grant. I'm going to pick up where Monica left off talking about um, shoreline oiling, but I'm going to shift the conversation from beaches to our marshes. So, many of you are probably already familiar with this, uh, this map of Louisiana indicating land loss from the year 1932 projected through 2050. Um, if you're not already familiar, Louisiana has a horrible problem with losing its land. Uh, we lose it at a rate of something like two football fields of land per hour. And so you might be kind of wondering where I'm going with this, right? Well, a lot of that land that we're losing, indicated in blue, is actually marsh. Marsh, wetland, whatever you want to call it, it's valuable and it's fragile, right? So if we, we think about this in the context of the oil spill, again, using Louisiana as an example, looking at this, this inserted map here, um, the areas of heavy oiling in red, uh, you can see that those areas really coincide with the, these areas that we're losing, right? So we don't want to do anything to exacerbate this really, really uh, big problem of land loss. So, you might have a guess of where I'm going with this. What are, what are the impacts of heavy oiling in those marshes? So again, if we use uh, Veritary Bay in Louisiana as an example, some of the research that's been done since the oil spill um, has found that, yes, heavy oiling, not surprisingly, exacerbates land loss problems. And if we, we take a look at these two photographs, they're taken in the same location, two years apart. The panel on the left, um, was taken just before oil hit the shore. And you can see there's this nice, smooth, clean edge of the marsh indicating even rates of erosion. And then if I draw your attention to this photograph, the same location taken two years later, uh, you can see huge gouges taken out of the land, right, erosion. That's caused by heavy oiling. And how does this happen? Um, okay, so as I'm sure you know, Marsh plants can tolerate a certain amount of oiling. If it gets on the blades, a lot of times the plants can bounce back. They're resilient to a certain degree. However, if um, the roots have oil contact, um, the oil is toxic to them. They're going to die. They're going to go away. And remember, marsh roots are what's giving the wetlands its structural integrity. If you don't have the roots, you don't have a marsh what's holding all those fine grains of sediment together. So that's actually what's happening in B, in panel B there. Um, the marsh roots are actually gone, and so all the sediment, I don't know if you can tell in this lighting, but there's no sediment under there. It creates an overhang situation. So there's no sediment there, no land, and then this you know, residual bits of the marsh that are left. So instead of the marsh edge looking like this, it looks like this, and you can imagine with a lot of wave action and tides, eventually that overhang is gonna slump in the water, fall in, and it's gonna get washed away, right? So you're, you're losing land because of this heavy oiling event. And the real kicker, the real kicker, if I can get to it, is that it could take up to two years to see these impacts, right? So you're, it's not gonna be an overnight, oh my gosh, what happened to our marsh? It's gonna take time to see the impacts. All right, so I'm going to shift gears here a little bit, not so subtly. <laughs> um, so re recall that Monica was talking about the SRBs, those tar balls on the beach. 
maybe you, you've encountered oil in the marsh. How many of you have encountered oil along the Gulf Coast since the spill? Show of hands? Okay, lots of people. So you might have been wondering, like, is this from Deepwater Horizon, or is this from one of the 60-something natural oil seeps in our region, right? How do you know the difference? So that's where chemistry comes into play, and it's, it's really neat. Um, just as each of us has a fingerprint that's unique to each individual in this room, oil from different sources has a, oh, can you hear me? Sorry. <laughs> oil has, a, each source of oil has a fingerprint, a chemical profile, if you will, that's unique to that source. And so that's what this plot here is. Each one of those peaks is a different chemical component that makes up a condo well oil. And that's completely unique to that, that location. So you can kind of have some CSI action going on. Take something like, say, an SRV from the beach. You run it through a lot of sophisticated chemical analysis. You get a profile. And you take that Macondo well oil, run it through that same instrument, and you, you line up the profiles. And if they match, then you can say, yes, yes, that tar ball is because of the spill. Or, no, it's not. So that's really cool right it's just like the tv show csi and it's wrapped up in an hour nice and tidy <laughs> as we know nature doesn't work like that and so we have these other things like sunlight and temperature like high temperatures and oxygen and microbial degradation and this is going to change the chemistry of the oil and that's going to take that nice clear fingerprint into a smudgy one so that's that same type of oil, Epicondo well oil, after weathering, after that aging process occurs. And you can see that it looks so different after just a year. But fortunately, chemists are constantly working on um, new ways of better identifying oil and, and new compounds that they can use as markers to correctly identify the source of oil. Okay, so Monica brought up the subject of dispersants, right? And we know that they were used to help mitigate the impacts of onshore oiling, right? So keep the, the oil out of our beaches, out of our marshes, so we use dispersants. And they work, as she mentioned, by breaking up the oil into small droplets um, with the help of wave action. And then that's going to make it easier for the microbes to <coughs> essentially munch on the oil, right? To degrade it, to get rid of it. So an unintended consequence of this is that it actually, this person's actually uh, make oil-based compounds more available to aquatic life. And when I'm saying oil-based compounds, really I'm just talking about this, this group of, of compounds called PAHs, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. And they can actually make up just a small fraction of the oil, like something like 3%, 30%. Um, but the reason why they're the focus is so much seafood safety testing and health impact studies is because some, not all of them, are toxic. They can cause mutations and cancer. So we really try to focus our efforts on understanding the effects of PAHs. So uh, that might leave you wondering, well, what does that do to the fish that you like to look for, right? To go and eat. <laughs> OK, so there is some good news in this story now that you're all sufficiently scared, right? <laughs> Um, there's a gene that, that vertebrates have, humans included, and also fish, called CYP1A. And CYP1A is a gene that is essentially, when, when you're exposed to a toxin, especially like oil, um, pH is from oil, that gene is going to trigger the production of a protein that will help your body break down PAHs and metabolize them and um, eliminate them from your body. So. Uh, so that you can't bioaccumulate them, so that you can't um, have additional health problems, right? That's the idea. So what about animals that don't have that, that gene, or maybe they only have very low levels of it, like jellyfish, coca pods? Uh, unfortunately, they're going to accumulate those compounds. <coughs> so then you might be thinking, well, but what about my oysters, right? Oysters, you know, don't necessarily have a great uh, detoxification mechanism in place in their bodies, you would sort of expect them to accumulate all those oil-based compounds, right? But if you look at the literature, all the studies since the spill have found really surprising results that 
Oysters don't seem to have the accumulation of these compounds in their tissues or in their shells. How is this possible? There's actually some really neat research that just came out in the past year or so that shows that the microbiome, the suite of, of uh, bacteria that's in the body of the oysters and in the, the mantle fluid actually helps degrade as much as something like 40% of those, those PAH compounds. So that's kind of like their way of striking back. Um, an additionally interesting uh, property about this, this gene that I keep telling you about that I think that all of us should know about is that um, it can be used as a biomarker to understand where boiling has occurred, right? Because that's something that can be tricky. So the keelie fish, which is a bait fish that, you know, any recreational fishermen? Yeah, lots of people, right, because it's sea grant? Okay, so the killifish, fish, um, you know, likes to hang out close to home. And because of their home body nature, scientists can actually go to a location, sample those fish, and take them back to the lab, look at that, that level of that gene, and say, hey, yeah, that, that fish was exposed to oil. So they, they seem really stressed based on their gene expression levels. And so that now we know that that location had some level of oiling. So that's, that's kind of a cool thing that has come out of all of this, um, this tragedy. So since I only have a couple minutes left, I'm going to fly through the next couple slides. Um, but something to keep in mind is that while the body does have this detoxification mechanism, um, there, there can still be impacts. So things like body size can be greatly reduced. Also the impacts will, will greatly uh, change based on the age that the animal is exposed to these chemicals. So like for example with Magi Magi, um, if you expose embryos to PAHs and then you stop exposing them, let them grow up into juveniles, um, they have slower swimming speeds at just like 1.2 ppbs of those compounds. But if you only expose them as juveniles, then it takes much higher levels of that same compound to reduce their swimming rate. Uh, there's also things like deformities, like with our bluefin tuna. I don't know how well you can see this, but this is a, a tail fin of a developing tuna larvae. And you can see how nice and straight the tail is. It kind of looks like a paddle. Then under pretty low concentrations of these PAH, as you can see, it's pretty deformed looking. So that's going to impact its swimming ability, right? So this is a problem. Anyway, so these are just a few of the, the impacts to individuals. And Chris is going to talk about um, how this scales up to the population and the community level. I'm going to let her talk about those impacts. Uh, Landings data uh, publicly available uh, from NOAA, NIMS, 
And this actually was an idea I borrowed from Rex a while ago from a presentation he did. But it shows land over time from 1991 to 2013. And it shows the fluctuations, the rise and fall of land use. For those of you that aren't familiar with fisheries lingo, land use is the amount of seafood brought to shore, usually weighed or counted. Um, and we've got pounds there. So the, the pounds land that changes over time. And so fishers, resource managers, everyone uses landings um, to monitor change in populations. But again, that is a fishery dependent type of data. And we need fishery independent data to answer some of the other questions associated with what we're looking at. So people want to know from our audiences if the deep water rising oil spill impacted landings for many species. And there's it's important to keep in mind that there's other factors at play. Well, there there are huge disasters like hurricanes and oil spills that occur and probably impact our landings over time. There's other things like environmental changes and climatic changes to consider when trying to draw conclusions from information like landings. So what some scientists are doing to fill in some of those knowledge gaps is to conduct their, their own catch studies. And one group um, was looking at shrimp specifically, and they were measuring um, shrimp size, and they were counting shrimp abundance in estuaries in the Gulf of Mexico. And they actually found that um, shrimp, brown and white shrimp, actually increased in abundance after the oil spill which kind of goes against what you might initially think, that if there's a, a negative impact at the organism level, which we do know now, wouldn't that negative impact be reflected in the population number? So if shrimp are dying off, for example, because of this, this interaction with oil, how are they still proliferating? Well, these shrimp scientists um, have two theories on that. One theory is that because they were measuring size and they didn't find very significant results, they did see a pattern that there was some reduction in size of some of the shrimp they were looking at, they think that maybe the oil delayed growth of some of these shrimp. And because the growth was delayed, those shrimp were spending longer times in the estuaries. So shrimp, in a natural life cycle, spend time in the coastal areas to grow, then move offshore. So along come these scientists trying to collect their, their fishery independent data, and they're finding more shrimp in estuaries. And perhaps those shrimp just hadn't grown enough to move offshore at that time. So that would be why their abundance levels compared to the, the previous pre-spill data was increased. Or, alternatively, as we know, large areas of the Gulf of Mexico were closed to fishing during and after the oil spill. So perhaps those fishery closures enabled the shrimp population numbers to continue to increase. Another population example um, for a vital fishery species is the blue crab. Um, there are some scientists that were concerned with how the oil spill might have impacted the blue crab larvae. We know that the spill was happening during a time when many species were spawning in the Gulf. Um, of course, blue crab were too. So they were looking at um, specifically population connectivity. They wanted to know how subpopulations of blue crab were connecting with each other in the Gulf. Um, so collecting mass amounts of blue crab larvae in very large areas not only difficult, but very expensive. So they decided they opted for a computer modeling approach. And they took existing data sets um, for their models to, to figure out how the blue crab were actually being impacted. And they found, virtually, that there was, in fact, um, a large portion of the blue crab population exposed to the oil. But of those that survived the oil spill, they settled in a very specific location. So they were, these scientists were looking for larval dispersal of larval settlement patterns. And they found that the blue crab larvae settled east of the Mississippi River Delta. And of course, we all know how important the, the river delta there is um, and influences a lot of what goes on in the Gulf of Mexico. And that kind of site-specific, species-specific information can be very useful for emergency response and natural resource managers when going forward and making the oil spill response. So moving away from populations and getting more into the community level. Um, so how do, we, how do we understand what's going on with multiple species interacting in a given area? There's a couple of approaches I'm going to talk about today. One is looking at food web interactions. Another is simply um, community assemblage, so counting abundances of different populations together in an area. I'm going to start with a food web. So this actually, this paper that I'm referring to is Turnicky and Patterson. And they <coughs> this, this paper recently. Their original study was to look at red snapper feeding ecology, and they were comparing natural 
versus artificial reefs. And then the, the spill happened, so they had a very unique opportunity to put that into, throw that into the game plan and see what was going on with the feeding behavior of red snapper. And so uh, the, the red snapper, the adult red snapper, actually has a very opportunistic feeding behavior that will come along and anything they find. Um, but through gut analysis, they found that adult red snapper will eat a lot of zooplankton too. So about 15 to 20 percent of their diet consists of, of plankton, and the rest of it is this higher trophic level species, shrimp, crab, other fish. Um, red snapper don't actually have the morphology or the body parts to strain plankton out of the water column or even pick plankton out. Uh, scientists think that when red snapper come across swarms of plankton, that's how they're actually um, eating it, ingesting it. So a normal, that was a normal behavior, a normal feeding behavior of red snapper. Well, after the spill, through their gut analysis, they found there was a shift from less zooplankton and more to those higher trophic level species, like the banana shrimp, the butterfish, and the pretty squid. Um, and at first you might think, well, that's good. That means that there's a lot of available high calorie species out there for the plankton to eat. They don't need to rely on those tiny little zooplankton, on those opportunistic swarms of plankton, but these scientists are posing that this shift is actually a negative impact in itself, or some kind of impact in itself, possibly. As Monica mentioned a little bit earlier about the marine snow, so after the, the oil spill, there was a marine snow event, and there was a lot of organic material floating down to the deep sea, sea floor, and a portion of that marine snow was plankton. And so with the removal of that plankton from the available menu for the red snapper, they shifted to the other species. So given time, we might see also some differences in the abundance levels of those new menu items for the red snapper. Um, moving inshore to the seagrass meadows, uh, Fodri and Heck conducted a study looking at impacts, looking for impacts, um, stretching from Louisiana to Florida, and they found actually no negative impact to the abundance levels of multiple species utilizing those inshore areas like sea trout, snapper, pinefish, and a host of other organisms. Um, they were comparing post pre spill to post spill uh, data and three minutes ago. And they found no negative impact. And again, they have a lot of um, theories about why they didn't find an impact. But again, just like the shrimp guys, they're thinking that the fishery closures had a huge influence on enabling these, these fish species to proliferate. So real quick, I'm almost out of time, but um, there, there's a lot of work looking at the deep sea community, and um, scientists in the deep sea are looking at coral, and they're looking at coral as an organism, but also as a community. So coral in the deep and in the shallow as well, the mesopotic reefs too, they are a community upon itself. It's Coral species uh, support a lot of other organisms. There you can see a uh, species of sea star entwined in um, an octocoral, a deep sea octocoral. And they, they live like that. And there's also crabs, and there's also um, species that live in the sediment around the coral. But we found a negative impact to the coral in the deep sea. They definitely, especially one site specifically, was in the path of the, of the plume. And that coral um, did suffer greatly, and they found droplets of the oil in the flocculent, so coral has this natural ability to create mucus um, to protect itself and, and other functions as well. But they found oil in that flock, um, and then over time they came back and they found some branches dead and dying. And they actually saw that sea star, maybe not that one specifically, but those sea stars that live on those coral branches, um, they're normally reddish to tan in color, and they normally you know, hang on for dear life on those coral branches to, to function normally. When they came back, they found it was sort of limp and swaying off in the, in the current and it changed color to white. So that was indicative of a negative impact. And they're continuing to look on in the, in the sediment as well. There's some negative impacts going on with the fauna there too. So coral are evolving as an important indicator of ecosystem health in the deep. I'm going to bring back to fish um, because it's going to be a nice lead into what we're going to share with you. But this is a really awesome study coming out of Florida. Dr. Susan Snyder um, is looking at three species. And she's looking at these three species specifically because they, they occupy a very unique niche in uh, the middle to deep sea. And so we've got uh, the golden tile fish. The golden tile fish is really cool because 
it lives and burrows in the sediment. It bioturbates and stirs up the sand. It spends a lot of time maintaining that burrow, so it's constantly re-exposing itself to potentially contaminated sediment. So that fish is considered to be at um, heavy risk to exposure. Another fish she looked at, um, as you can see her stretched out next to her king, king snake eel there on the boat, um, the king snake eel spends a lot of time on the sea floor, but doesn't burrow quite as much as the golden tile fish, and, um, but does spend a lot of time on the surface of the sediment looking for food. And then of course the red snapper spends more of its time in the water column relating to reefs and other structures to look for food, and will go down to the bentos as well to look for food. <coughs> So she was looking for exposure levels of these three fish, and she found that their habitat behavior played a huge role in that exposure. The golden tile fish had a significantly um, larger amount of exposure, a lot of larger concentration, and she did this study over three years. Over time, the golden tile fish concentration increased, whereas there was a significant amount of exposure in the red snapper and king snake eel, but that decreased over time. And she poses that perhaps it's their behavior um, that plays a big role in that. So golden pile fish, again, spending a lot of time burrowing, um, recirculating that pH exposure um, could have a huge impact on the health of that species and can tell us a lot about the community there. So pulling it all together, again, you can plug in whatever animal plane you want, this sort of idea, but moving forward and understanding these larger ecosystem impact questions. We know there's a negative impact at the organ We've seen some sort of negative or impacts in general at the population and community level. We know there's a negative impact to the habitats, and we talked a little bit about that, so they want to go. We know that the fisheries themselves have been negatively impacted, and the fishery closures themselves are playing a role in what we're seeing out there, so the management actions. There's a lot of things to consider when we make conclusions about ecosystem impacts, and we're also looking to other incidents like the Exxon Valley spill in the 80s. It took them 30 years, it took us 30 years to really understand the changes in those populations and communities. So we're prepared for the long term to keep looking out and monitoring those changes. With that, I'm going to invite Rissa up to step into the world of health. Okay, is this on? Okay. Hi everyone, my name is Larissa. I work for Mississippi Alabama Sea Grant. And I'm going to be talking about two things that relate to health first. <coughs> seafood testing, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with. And then also, um, and then I'll also be talking about some of the impacts that the oil spill had on mental health of our Gulf Coast residents. So I'm sure many of you are aware that during the oil spill, a lot of U.S. waters were closed to fishing. So this was either because oil was found in those areas or NOAA models predicted that oil was going to come to those areas. So at the height of the oil spill, about 36% of U.S. waters were closed to fishing. And because these waters were closed, state and federal agencies had to come up with some sort of protocol or plan to reopen those. So I'm going to show you a graphic here that's in one of our publications that we just released. So in areas that were closed where oil was never found, those waters were reopened after they kind of double checked with aerial surveys, water quality tests, satellite images. On the other hand, areas that were closed and oil was still present, those areas remained closed. So what happened to the other areas? In areas that were closed and then there was no longer any signs of deep water horizon oil spill, they went through this process. So the first thing that happened was scientists went out and they collected different species that were commercially and recreationally important in different habitat types, areas, depths. And then they went through a series of tests. So the first thing they did was a sensory test. So some of you might have done the sensory test training. Um, they actually, so we had trained experts smell and taste cooked and raw seafood for taint. So kind of a chemical taint, something that might be off-putting for a consumer. If the sample was tainted, then those areas would remain closed. If there was no taint, no smell or taste that was off-putting, then it went, those samples went on to the next step, which was chemical testing. So they tested for two things, those PAHs, which Emily mentioned are those chemicals found in oil, and then DOS, which Monica mentioned are those is a chemical found in dispersant. So if the chemicals were above the safety limits, they said, okay, we will keep those waters closed. 
If they were below the safety limits and there was no health concerns, they would reopen the waters. So this is the process they came up with. What did they actually find? So this is a graphic that's in our Healthy Gulf Seafood, uh, the publication in the back. So this blue box down on the bottom, that is the federal, the sampling that the federal agencies did in federal and state waters. So that was mostly NOAA and FDA. They sampled about 8,000 samples, and then the states picked up either while this federal program was going on or after and sampled another 14,000 samples. In total, there was 22,000 samples collected around the Gulf through the studies that are shown here, and not one was above safety concerns. So all of the samples that were tested were safe for consumers to eat. So yeah, so this shows all the different states and the dates of sampling, uh, what they sampled for, and I guess one other thing to mention is that what they looked at is the edible portions of fin fish, crabs, shrimp, and oysters. That's what they were testing for. So remember this part right here, this blue part, because we're going to be talking about that in the next two slides. So to look a little closer at those 8,000 samples, we actually got that data from NOAA and we broke it down into cancer-causing PAHs and non-cancer-causing PAHs. So in that, so you see the PAHs, and then in the next row, it's the FDA level of concerns. So that's the amount of chemical at which it would have harm on us. So those are, level of concerns are set by FDA. And so then in the next column, you have the highest level of PAHs. So we looked at NOAA's data and we pulled out those maximum levels that were found in those 8,000 samples. And they were samples, um, it's the level of PAHs before the oil spill and then after. So two points to take away from this table. First, that the level of PAHs was very similar when they did their sampling before the oil spill and after. And then the second thing to take away is that the levels of PAHs are much lower than the FDA level of concern. So those are the cancer-causing PAHs. And then to move on to the non-cancer-causing PAHs, you see the same thing. So levels are relatively even, or relatively the same before and after the spill when they reopen these areas to fishing. And again, they're far lower than the level of concern. So those are parts per billion there. So we talk about these level of concerns. Well, how much does someone have to eat to reach that level of concern? And according to Louisiana's Department of Wildlife and Fisheries, an average consumer could eat 63 pounds of field shrimp, 130 oysters, nine pounds of fin fish every single day for five years before they reach that level of concern. So I might take on that task of eating that much seafood, but um, that's, a lot, that's a lot to eat. And we talk a lot about the average consumer, but we do know that not, ever, not one size fits all. So one size doesn't fit all. So we've had, there's some researchers that are currently looking at some of these populations that might be these at-risk consumers. Uh, there's only one published study so far, but there's at least three more projects that I know that are underway. And they're looking at communities where you know, they create these, they calculate these level of concerns using the average. So they have this average body weight, average lifespan, average amount of seafood that someone might eat. But we know down on the Gulf Coast, we like our seafood. And so we might eat more than the average person nationwide. And some of our communities might weigh less than the average person. So um, Dr. Wilson, who's out of Tulane, he's published a study where he went into Vietnamese communities and actually sampled their seafood and also calculated level of concerns for these groups. And he saw that even using these very conservative level of concerns, their seafood was still safe for them to eat. So now to shift gears a little bit to something that I'm quite passionate about, which is the impacts of the oil spill on mental health. So we know that during the oil spill and after, there was drastic shifts in different industries. So we've talked a lot about um, the fishing industry and how waters were closed. Um, Emily talked a little bit about the oiling in wetlands, and one area in Barataria Bay, Louisiana, was not even open until this past summer. So five years after the oil spill, they just reopened the last of their areas in some of those wetlands to fishing. So we know that the commercial fishery and recreational fishing industries were impacted. 
we also know that the tourism industry was impacted. So people saw all this media with all these oil beaches, they might have canceled their vacations. And then lastly, the oil and gas industry was affected as well as there was a six month moratorium on offshore drilling. So scientists have looked a lot about what these impacts had, how, these in, how the income loss, the people that relied on the Gulf for their jobs, how the income loss really impacted these communities. And they saw higher levels of stress and anxiety in these residents. So I just wanna quickly highlight a couple of studies just to show you some of the results from the studies that were conducted around the Gulf. So scientists looked at residents over in Mississippi and Alabama that had suffered an income loss and they saw that they really reported, um, they felt very negative about life, they were diagnosed with depression and also had high rates of anxiety. Some scientists focused in a little bit more um, to the, with looking at the folks in Mobile County and they saw that a lot of the folks that they interviewed were really concerned about their economic loss and future income. To switch over to Alabama and Florida, a lot of folks that suffered an income loss had high rates of depression and anxiety and these impacts lingered over time. So even a year after the spill, scientists went back to talk to these folks and 80% of those that had suffered an income loss were diagnosed with depression and 90% were suffering from anxiety. Same was true in Louisiana, where counselors reported an increase in anxiety, depression, drinking, and thoughts of suicide in the folks that they talked about. And they also, scientists also saw that this income loss not only affected adults, but also children. So parents that had suffered an income loss, they were three times more likely to report a mental or physical health problem in their children. So I just wanted to talk about some of those studies just to show you that residents that relied on the Gulf for income really suffered more than other residents. And within those different industries, we saw that the fishing industry was hit harder than others. So we talked about closed waters. So um, a lot of these folks were out of work while those fishing grounds were closed. Also public perception, one of the most common things people still ask us, which might surprise you, but is Gulf seafood safe to eat? So there's still this lingering public perception that seafood isn't safe. And also, as Chris was talking about with some of the long-term impacts with, um, with community and population levels, there was also a lot of uncertainty about what was gonna happen with these, these fish populations. So I'm running a lot of time, so I won't read this. Well, I will, okay. I'm just not sure what to do now. In the past, things will always seem like they pop up, but this time I see it coming to an end really, really fast here, and I'm just really kind of scared. I mean, it costs a lot of money to live. So that's a quote from one of the fishermen that was uh, quoted in one of these studies. So scientists also looked at community attachment, which is how attached community members are to one another and then the place they live. So for those that focus on resiliency, you know this can be a good thing, because if you have these strong networks in place, then after disaster, you might be quicker to recover. But on the other hand, things community attachment can be a bad thing because if you're very attached to the place that you live, you might not want to move away, even if you know, you're kind of being forced to. So scientists looked at residents, and they saw that those residents with high level of attachment, right after the spill, they had a lot of these bad feelings. They were really angry, worried about the future. Then they went back into those communities a year later and they saw that these residents were actually recovering better than others that were not as attached to their community. So this supports the idea that these strong networks and close personal relationships can really help people recover from disasters. This wasn't true for all, communities though, so back to the fishing industry that was really hard hit. They went into those communities right after the spill, saw a lot of those bad feelings. A year after, they saw that fishing folks that were really highly attached to their community, they were still suffering and in some conditions, things were actually getting worse for these folks. So this could be because a year after the spill, we know that the commercial fishing industry was still facing a lot of hardships. Also, that their attachment to their community might make them less likely to want to move on and find another livelihood. And also, we know that social networks might have created this cycle of negative outlook. So if you're around people that are negative all the time, chances are you're gonna feel a little negative too. So just lastly, I wanna talk a little bit about resilience. So the Gulf Coast is no 
no stranger to disasters. We have a lot of hurricanes, but the oil spill is a little bit different because it was a man-made disaster and left a lot of uncertainty. So this is one quote from a paper. With Katrina, we knew what to do. We needed to rebuild. With the oil spill, we don't know how long the recovery will take or if we will be able to recover. So people really faced a lot of uncertainty after the oil spill, just worried about what the future would hold. And scientists did study residents in southeastern Louisiana who really suffered during Katrina, and they found that these folks were more vulnerable to the impacts of the oil spill, but they also saw that they recovered faster than other communities. And so they think that this might suggest that past disasters have taught these residents to be able to adapt and cope and recover more quickly during times of disaster. So I just have one more slide to wrap up, and I know I talked a lot about mental health, and that's because that's what a lot of the published data focuses on. Those published papers are all about mental health. A lot of the physical health work is going to be out within the next couple of years. Um, there's the Gulf study that's looking at cleanup workers, the Deepwater Horizon Research Consortia that has four projects which are focusing on women and children's health, and then also a lot on seafood safety, so looking at those more vulnerable communities. And the Gulf Re Region Health Outreach Program, GR Hop, that program actually has been working really hard to build up infrastructure related to health. So making sure that when there is another disaster, we have the people and places in place to be able to respond to um, that disaster. And then lastly, the Consortium for Resilient Communities is actually working with three communities around the Gulf to um, come up with some communication strategies. So with that, I will turn it back over to Steve to wrap us up. Thank you very much. Um, so, so we have quite a few things we got to share. Some of the science with you, obviously, there's more and more science coming out every day. There's literally hundreds of publications that our team is going through trying to digest, translate, synthesize, and deliver. Um, we do have three dispersant publications. Those will be the next three out on the street. We're working on the layout of those. There's at least seven others, plus two, two more, I think, that we'll have done um, by next summer um, as well.